to the Future of Field Service podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Nicastro. Today, we're going to be talking with Rehana Arani Famili, VP of Business Readiness at National Grid, about how the company is preparing for COVID-19 recovery. Rehana, welcome so much to the Future of Field Service podcast. We're happy to have you. Thank you, Sarah. It's good to be here. Good. So if you could start by just giving uh, the audience an overview of National Grid's business and what your role is with the organization. So National Grid is the second largest uh, utility in in the U.S. And uh, we operate in three jurisdictions. We operate in uh, New York, both upstate and downstate New York. We operate in Rhode Island and we operate also in Massachusetts. Um, we serve about 20 million people, so six, that, six million bills, basically, that we manage um, on a monthly basis. And we have 17,000 people that, whether it's in the field or in the office, that support that operation. And we provide gas and electricity um, to those customers. So um, our 60% of our customers roughly are, are gas customers and the rest are elect- uh, electricity customers. Um, and so, so yes, with that, uh, the current situation has especially hit us um, hard with us being um, a main provider of utility in, in, in New York State. Absolutely. So your title is um, Vice President of Business Readiness. So um, give our listeners just a bit of context uh, in, in what your role and responsibilities entail. Yeah, so um, that's uh, that's a really good question. And, and interestingly enough, I had this title pre-COVID. So. <laughs> I was going to say it sounds like the kind of title that is you would be in the hot seat right now. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, yeah. um, you know, it, it would be uh, maybe sudden, you're losing some sleep. More relevant. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I we have um, like many other companies we're going through. We have been going through a, t- a tremendous amount of uh, change. So. Um, if you think about National Grid and its purpose of bringing energy to life for our customers and that the expectation of our customers, whether it's on the choices they want for their for their energy uh, consumption, uh, whether it's the technology and how we service them, has been changing very rapidly. So as National Grid, we have um, this transformation office, which its focus is on uh, driving this change from all aspects whether it's technology and technology implementation, the roles, behaviors, um, capabilities that we need across the organization. And my role within that is uh, enterprise change, which is how do we enable um, a different future for the organization and how do we plan around that, as well as um, – capabilities that major programs would need to succeed, um, like value realization and how do we do that and, and change management and how do we do that. And so um, that that's been that's been my role with the organization. Um, in the last two, two and a half months, um, like every every other person in every other organization, that expanded to how do we support Mm-hmm. Um, the current situation, and so um, whether it was how do we how do we engage people virtually, and and um, or how do we plan for the future of work um, in the workplace? Mm-hmm. So those are the things that I have started to get um, get involved in and 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 work on. Yeah. Um, just just kind of taking us off script a, a bit for a couple of minutes because hearing. Um, you know, what your role encompasses just made me think of a couple of things. I mean, first of all, how important of a role it is, knowing that, you know, as I talk with service-based businesses, um, change management is where a lot of things go wrong. You know, I mean, it really is a, a, a critical aspect of, um, of you know, operational change, technological change, service delivery change, you know, customer experience um, initiatives, you know, there's, it, it's really the cornerstone of um, a lot of ways that companies are innovating and transforming their businesses. And it, it it's 
I would say probably the biggest area that people fall down, you know, and, and so, um, no pressure, <laughs> but no, uh, I'm sure it's a really fun, I'm sure it's a really fun role, but also, you know, it, it's, it's, it, I'm sure there's some weight to it because there's, there's a lot riding on being able to execute that, that change management, um, well. Yeah, and I and I think um, and I, and I always say change is role of every leader, mm-hmm. um, and it's a capability that every good leader in the organization would need to have. Now, what you do centrally is to uh, support that and to enable that and to guide that. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, the only way a change initiative will be successful is if all leaders driving it are change capable leaders and change ready leaders yeah. and they have the resilience that it takes um to drive change in an organization and i think um the current situation it has been a great school for a lot of our leaders to practice that um especially in operational roles sometimes um we become com- complacent Mm-hmm. in believing that we can do the same thing and 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 not really um drive and inspire and 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 step up uh as a leader within the organization and so a situation like this it's actually it's helping leaders across across the utility industry service industry all industries to build that um change readiness muscle and i think we are all going to emerge better as a result of it um, it's funny. That was actually the second point I was going to bring up, and, and you said it for me, which is um, I, w- I was going to ask your thoughts on exactly that point. We're, what we're seeing is this situation really um, breaking down a lot of barriers to, to change within companies, you know, whether it's a, well, this is how we've always done it, so we'll just keep doing it this way, or, you know, I'm smarter than that technology, or, you know, there's so many different things, or just... I'm too busy, right? Like I'm, I'm too busy doing, doing what I need to do to be thinking about how to, to be innovative or to do things differently. So, um, I, I was going to ask you if you've seen the same and, and you, you, um, you just said that you had. And I think, I think you're right. I think that's, um, a universal recognition right now. And I absolutely think that, you know, it will make service organizations stronger coming out of this because, to be honest, I mean, there's been a, an underlying evolution happening in service for quite some time in terms of, you know, customer demands changing and business models needing to change and the adoption of technology needing to ramp up and all of that. And I think that, um, you know, this situation has has forced the hand of some of the organizations that were a bit more resistant to that. And so I think, you know, it'll be really exciting to see what comes out of it. You know, there's there's obviously um, some positives to this this overall negative. And I think that that openness um, is is a really good lesson that that people will get out of this. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I, I was going to add to that. It's uh, one of the things that I've been really passionate about is this notion of um, industrial revolution, the 4.0, mm-hmm. and and the fact that the technologies that were created over the past decade, mm-hmm. uh, really our organizations haven't caught up. So we haven't really, we've seen a lot of advancement in technology. We haven't seen the same amount of productivity uptick in the organizations that is the full potential of those technologies. And I think the current situation has, has really fast tracked that adoption. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I truly believe that, um, coming out of it, we are going to start seeing a, a massive productivity shift mm-hmm. that we've been lagging. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but this was something that I was, I, <laughs> my geeky side, uh, I've been looking at and researching about a year, year and a half ago. Um, and it, it's been fascinating to see the gap in productivity growth to technology growth. And I mm-hmm. think this current situation is going to cl- um, start the path of closing that gap, which is yeah. fascinating. Yeah, because I, I think a lot of times that gap is because of, you know, not successfully managing that change, whether that's because it was under prioritized, under budgeted, 
um, or just not done well or ignored. You know, there's a there's a every story is a little bit different. But that's why I said, you know, it's one of those areas that um, that really are a major failure point in a lot of organizations. And, and I would bet that that gap is is a lot of you know, poor change management. Yeah, so yeah. people uh, being more open to change gives, you know, folks that are, are willing to, um, you know, to, to put good change management initiatives in place, the opportunity to execute on them well and really see, you know, the, the results of that. So you'll have to keep me posted. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So going back to, back to our script uh, a bit. So, um, you know, as, as, COVID-19 hit, uh, you went from, you know, being in the office and leading a team in person to being remote, like, you know, many of the rest of us and, and really having to do a, a quick, um, quick study on virtual leadership. Um, so you recently outlined, uh, four points that you've found or learned as you've adjusted to virtual leadership. And I was hoping you could talk through those. So, the first is continuing to be proactive. So tell everyone what you mean by that. So what I found um, as we as we went into the lockdowns in, in March, um, what I found was those first few weeks became about survival. Mm -hmm. And we were so busy with the here and now and getting things done and, and finishing things up and uh that we stopped thinking about the future. Um, whether you were on calls, you were doing work, um, I was seeing it in myself, I was seeing it in other leaders, and I was seeing it in, in my team, that we have, um, our focus have really shifted to firefighting, and we lost um, that longer-term thinking. And I really had to um, stop myself um, and think about it and talk to my team about it of how do we create space mm -hmm. um, to think think strategically think beyond here and now um, and and start and start looking ahead the role of us as senior leaders in the organization is to look ahead for the organization mm -hmm. and if we are all uh, trying to fight the today's fire then we're going to be missing a big opportunity so I think I think that has been one of my um, one of my early observations and things that that we had to step in and, and work on yeah that's a really it's a really good point um, I know you know just even speaking for myself personally um, I maybe have have stopped looking forward as much because there's so much unknown, you know, and that can be really uncomfortable. And I think it's it's the same for business leaders. It's it's tough to, you know, think about the future when you really don't know what the future is going to be. But it's very very important to do so anyway, and to to plan for some different scenarios and to to keep on the pulse of, you know, not only what's happening but what's coming and and all of that. So. It's a very good point. Sarah, and that's a very good point you're making because I, the, the future, even today, the future is very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, we can plan for the next day, not even the mm -hmm. next two weeks. But what is important is, is knowing the possible scenarios and being able to think through how would our strategies or our plans change in each of those given scenarios and more importantly what is going to remain the same mm -hmm. and so the things that are going to remain the same how are we going to attack them um, and, and things that are going to be a little bit more uncertain how do we put boundaries around it and then react mm -hmm. um, and and getting people to think through those, I think the important part is that the clarity um, of those so that people, everybody's thinking about those scenarios the same way and mm -hmm. everyone is doing that mental test um, for, for their individual plans because everyone at every level in the organization would need to do that for the work that they're responsible for. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so lesson two is actively manage interdependencies. So let's talk oh. about that. Yes. So um, interdependency between programs and projects are always 
a risk, a challenging um, area um, when you when you have multiple large programs and projects. Um, and a lot of it is managed through informal communication. Um, there, are, there are ways of formalizing it and putting structure around it, but at the end of the day, it's those hallway chats and conversations and, and um, somebody's in two meetings and here's something here and something there, and you, you start managing those interdependencies. What happened um, when we all went virtual those informal lines of communication really um, got weakened originally. And so um, as a leader, um, I, I saw that gap and I felt that it was my responsibility to need to step in and and be more of the navigator um, and the, the alert for those interdependencies and then managing through them. Um, Ultimately, that is not something that is sustainable mm -hmm. um, in the long run. I think ultimately what needs to happen is that we need to rebuild those lines of communication somehow in this virtual world, um, whether it's having the right meetings, right people, more effective meetings, whatever that is going to be. Um, but I think in the short run, um, it, it, it is an important part of a leader's role to step in and close that gap. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, number three is prioritize visibility into outcomes and values. Yes. Um, when when people when people are virtual, they need the clarity of their um, of the deliverable that they're driving. You're not managing people daily. They don't see you to check things. And so the more clarity you can create for the outcome that they are working towards, um, and honestly, right now we're not, I don't think any business is, is um, a, an eight to five business. Mm -hmm. So you're managing work from home and you're managing work from home all at the same time. And so um, expecting people to have set times that they would do things in and then assessing them based on um, how many hours they sat in the chair and did something it becomes irrelevant. Um, and I'm glad that it is becoming irrelevant because it's a better way of working. But mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so with that, you need to replace that eight to five mentality um, by a deliverable-based mentality and a value-based mentality. And it's both for the leaders and the companies as well as for those employees. Because as an employee, if before my success was I spent eight hours in, in the office, mm -hmm. now that needs to be replaced by this is the value that I have created in the hours that I um, was working or being productive. And so um, it became really obvious for me very early on that the more clarity you can give on the outcomes and the value that you're trying to drive and less about how they would get to that, um, mm -hmm. it it helps people be more productive, more engaged, um, and it would it, it would really um, make sure that that your productivity doesn't get impacted by this mm -hmm. sudden um, move to a virtual environment. We had yeah. no prep time. No one had any prep time. It yeah. was it was here it is and go. So the mechanisms that you usually create, whether it's lines of communication or training or communication, um, in in the in in a normal circumstance for a planned move to a virtual work, none of that was in place. And so mm -hmm. um so I think those that, that became became a real need very quickly. And I think mm -hmm. if if you're a leader out there that haven't done it yet, make sure you do and you look at all of your groups and make sure that their outcomes are very clear and the value of those outcomes are, are identified and, and, and clearly posted. Yeah, that makes sense. And I agree with you. I think ultimately it's a far better method of work. Um, you know, I think in, in the world we live in, it's it's um, unrealistic to have those um, 
those expectations and, and just more valuable for people to be clear on, you know, what what are the goals you need to achieve? What is the value you bring to the operation and, and how can you execute on that in a way that, you know, gives you the balance you need or, or what have you? Um, especially in this time, you know, I've been a remote employee all along. Um, so I'm, I'm well versed in, uh, in remote work productivity. Um, but my kids usually aren't home, you know, so that was a huge adjustment for me to, you know, sort out, um, I'm, I'm fortunate to have help, but more interruptions during the day and, and all of that. And so it, it is far easier to balance everything if you know, the outcomes and value that you are responsible for versus, you know, working off of, of a time structure. Um, okay, and the, the last lesson is remembering the importance of informal communication. Yeah, and I think and I think we, we kind of covered uh, that in the other uh, topics that we discussed, but the connections, the the human connections, are not built by emails and town hall meetings. Mm -hmm. They're built by those personal conversations. You and I, we just talked about our kids running out in the yard, or um, and 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 that doesn't come in in a formal setting. And without those, it's really difficult to build the human connections. And so I I think. Um, what I started to notice early on was that people were relying on the formal WebEx Teams meetings, Skype meetings um, to connect. And it's like we all forgot that at one point, not that far ago, long ago, we used to call each other on our phones mm -hmm. and we even memorized um, <laughs> some of the numbers. Um, and, and so like, it was, it was, it was the, I think week three, I was like, why aren't we just picking up the phone and calling each other? Mm -hmm. Why aren't we, why aren't we just doing these informal chats? Why does everything have to be these back to back, um, meetings and WebExes and team meetings? And, and so I started encouraging, I started doing that myself of just picking up whether it was a peer, um, it was my boss or it was my my um, my team uh, just calling them up and um, and 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 having those conversations and I saw it I saw them starting to do that and I mm -hmm. saw a huge difference um, in in the mood and the dynamic and the flow of information and the and the speed that the work was being done yeah. I, I, yeah, that's a good tip. I've heard um, some different folks say in in other conversations that when this first started, there was this sense of of kind of almost more connection because to your point, you're inviting people into your home, right? So you're, you know, having these video calls and and they're seeing your kids or your cat or your dog or you know whatever, and you know it kind of gave a, a different sense of connection to you know people that you normally just saw in the office. Um, but I've talked with some folks recently who feel like, you know, their teams are really starting to get a bit burnt out on all of the, the communication being virtual and, you know, which is understandable. I mean, I feel the same way, but, um, you know, so I think the other aspect of the informal communication is, is the true informal side in terms of just remembering people are people and, you know, you might need to just check in and, you know, see how someone's doing or, um, you know, someone brought up a point that, you know, when you have face to face meetings, you can sometimes pick up on cues that you may not in a virtual setting of, of someone being frustrated or someone struggling a little bit or, or this or that. And so, you know, just doing, doing your best to stay in tune with those sorts of things and, you know, figure out how to, to tackle them in this sort of situation. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a really important point because those social cues, like our brains are pre-wired to respond to them and now mm -hmm. they're gone mm -hmm. um, or are harder to pick up on. Um, yeah. when you're when you're uh, virtual but the other thing we did the first few weeks we did invite each other into our rooms and bedrooms and 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 I remember having to go from room to room in my office and, and thinking oh my god like they I, I I never thought that 
the whole um, executive team is going to see my guest room. Right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and 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 they did. And but it it wore off. And what was left was this feeling of like you have to be always on. Mm-hmm. And and then you have back to back on camera meetings um and it it's it's really tiring and it's frustrating mm-hmm. and so i think what we're doing which has been has been really helping is shortening our meetings to 45 minutes mm-hmm. um sometimes they go longer but such as life mm-hmm. um i think i think as long as the 80 20 rule i can keep 80 percent of them within that 45 minutes i'm happy uh and and then, and then alternating between, um, sitting in front of computer meetings and on the phone walking around meetings. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that, that has been, that has been really, um, important into breaking, uh, the, the, the flow and, yeah. um, really helping people be more productive. Yeah, I need to do a better job of that because I, I've been sensing, um, you know, I'm getting a bit burnout because it's video conference after video conference after video conference. And, and another thing that's come up in, in some of my conversations is people aren't really taking time off right now because there's nothing to do. Right. So people just keep working and keep working and keep working. Um and, uh, you know, that, that's an interesting concept as well. You know, you, so I think I'm, I'm about due for a little break. <laughs> I, well, I'm taking, I don't know what I'm I'll taking, do with myself, but, um, <laughs> but something. No, I'm taking a few days off this week, actually. And, and, um, I don't remember the exact numbers, but right now, but I think like 46% less people are taking, mm-hmm. um, vacation now that they, they have been before. Um, and what I've, what is interesting for me is the need to refresh, the need to rejuvenate, the need mm-hmm. to de-stress hasn't gone away. If anything, it has increased. Absolutely. Now, why we correlate taking time off with being away, and if I can't get a flight ticket, therefore mm-hmm. I can't take vacation, I don't know. I'm taking time off. I'm really encouraging my team to take time off, and not just one day, but at least the two, three days. Um, and, and, I, and I think it would be really important. Again, back to that proactive uh, mm-hmm. mindset to innovate, to look ahead, um, and to be able to think strategically it is critical to have a clear mind and a clear yeah. view and, and not be in that survival mode all the time. Yep. So, so Sarah, take your break. <laughs> yep. I'm, I'm, take, I'm taking notes. I'm going to do it. Okay. Um, so a couple more things I wanted to talk about. Yeah. The next is, um, you know, the discussion around return to work, right? So this is, you know, the, to, uh, to your earlier point, you know, we, we kind of, the first few weeks of this, everyone was in crisis management mode. I mean, everyone was, you know, a lot of people were caught off guard. And even if they weren't caught off guard, you know, in, in terms of business continuity, they were certainly caught off guard in who would have thought a global pandemic, right? Um, so that that occurred, and then people started to, to sort of um, process that and look forward, as you said. And, and now it seems, you know, we're kind of getting to the point in different regions, in different countries where, you know, we're, we're in the recovery phase or the early stages of recovery, and people are, are now really talking a lot and thinking a lot about, okay, how do we get people back to work? How do we reach the next normal, you know, that sort of thing. So just curious, you know, where where National Grid is at with that, what your considerations are, um, you know, how your team is feeling about it, you know, anything you're you're willing to share around that. Yeah, so um, I think a, a few weeks ago, maybe about a month ago, um, we started looking at uh, kind of post – post the quarantine period, um, the phase one reopening and the phase two reopening. And so at that time, um, I actually did, did a kind of an informal survey with, with our teams um, of how 
much more or less productive they feel that they are and how many of them would want to go back to work um, the way that we did before a vaccine is found and then after the vaccine is found. I always, going in, I knew that we will never be back to everybody get in their car, drive into the office in a nine-to-five format. But the results and the response I saw from that was was far more surprising. So in our case, um, about 85% of our people thought that they were more productive Mm -hmm. um, than they have been before. And so... Now, my, my challenge and, and, and the follow up on, on that is how do you define productivity? Because mm-hmm. if, if your, if your days are getting longer and if your hours are getting longer, um, and you're doing more work, that's not necessarily productivity. But, but any, anyhow, 85%, big number, mm-hmm. need to do more work there. We're, we're, we're looking into that. Um, big portion of that is because of the driving. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and then, then you have other factors in there. Uh, then you look at how many people want to go back to the office before a vaccine's found. Um, and like it's less than 20% of people, mm-hmm. um, before a vaccine that feel comfortable going back into the office, even with the social distancing norms in place. Um, and you look after the vaccine. And it's only 30% of people that think that we would go back to the same or we should go back to the, to the same form and format that we were before. So you put all of this together and it, no matter how you look at it, whether you look at it from the lens of an employee and what they demand of their, um, companies or you look at it from, from the perspective of a company, and the productivity of the workers and the cost of facilities and the overhead of having people in the office, um, they both end in the same place, that mm-hmm. the new the new normal is not going to look like what we started with. And I don't think we are alone. I think globally mm-hmm. everyone's coming to that realization. And so what we've been now doing is starting to plan around how do you – institutionalize um, some of this into the way we work and how do you enable employees to be able to continue um, to work from home and what is that really going to look like? They are some things you cannot replace. Mm-hmm. Like you need, you need togetherness for certain type of collaboration, strategic thinking. So how, mm-hmm. how do you allow for that? And so those are all questions that we're we're starting to ask and we're starting to chan- um, to to implement um, and challenge basically. The other thing we're thinking about is how, how do you how do you drive change in a virtual environment? Mm-hmm. Um, if you think about if you think about the the theories around change and and it's important to hit the hearts and not the minds mm-hmm. and and how how do you do that virtually yeah so those are all questions that we're grappling with right now mhm yeah that's that is a really good question and i think that um you know, I've, I've talked with companies that are, you know, working on getting people back into the office. I've talked with with companies that, you know, don't think that that will, you know, really happen again, you know, and, and everywhere in between. Um, but it, it's certainly interesting to kind of sort through those factors and, and see, um, you know, I do think people are prioritizing, you know, the the needs of their employees the same way you are, you know, asking them what they're comfortable with and, you know, allowing them to, to feel empowered in, in helping make those decisions and, and all of that. Um, and I certainly think that's the, the right approach, but there's a lot of layers of complexity to your point in, you know, what that is going to look like and, um, how to make it all, all work. And none of us have those answers. So, you know, it's just a matter of, of sorting through all of it. Um, 
Do you have any other views or or thoughts on, you know, what this recovery might look like for National Grid and, you know, what the next normal might be just in terms of whether it's it's your team or or um, around change or just the business overall? So I think um, if you think about a utility and if you think about the the, the real core of our business of getting heat and electricity um, to people's homes, that doesn't change with COVID. Mm-hmm. I think um, our customers have been impacted by uh, by COVID, and we have uh, stepped in and helped them with with. Uh, Temporarily stopping our, our disconnects and, um, collections activities. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so there, there, there is a lot that we have done to help the customers and adjust. And I think that would continue. Um, I don't think that this is going to be, uh, for, for our customers, it's not going to be that quick of a recovery. It is going yeah. to take time. And so our job and our role is here to serve those customers and understanding their needs. And that mm-hmm. is definitely going to continue. Um, for our own business, I think, uh, we are going to continue to focus on reliable, um, clean energy for our customers mm-hmm. and working with our regulators to make sure that um, that the speed at which that we're working on um, the the these things is is um, in lockstep with the expectations yeah. and so um, so overall I'm I'm really optimistic that we are all going to come out of this um, as a better, as a better society, as a better, as a better, um, corporate, um, mm-hmm. infrastructure, we're going to learn a lot through it, all of us together. Um, and I think, and I think I'm seeing a lot of all, all sorts of corporations really giving a different lens and focus to how they serve their customers. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm really encouraged by that and I can't wait to see the outcome of it in a few years. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I think, um, you know, what you said about your customer, for your customers, this recovery isn't going to happen overnight. You know, I think that's true for everyone um, in, in terms of, you know, customers in all industries and companies in all industries. Um, I actually wrote an article this week. Um, about there is no new normal and and meaning um, I heard someone say that it's not the new normal it's the next normal right and so it's not I think the new normal gives us this connotation that we are okay we're going to flip from crisis to recovery and then this is what it's going to look like right and and the reality is it's going to be a series of next normals until you know that change pace of change slows a bit you know and then they they space out more but i think to start you know it's what's the next normal what's the next normal what's the next normal and just kind of keeping pace you know to your one of your first points you know continuing to be proactive about looking at what are the phases of this what are those next normals and how do we prepare for for the next one or two you know and and keep track of of what what we need to do next. So it will certainly be interesting. Um, you know, I've said all along, I've loved talking with companies through this, this challenging time. Um, one, I think it, it gives people, um, a platform for connection, which I think is very important right now. But for me, I mean, it's just been very, very interesting to, to see, you know, how people, um, are, are grappling with this and, and I think doing exceptionally well with a, a really difficult situation. Um, but I'm, I'm very interested to, to follow this along and see how it evolves because I think some of the lessons we're learning now and how those play out over the next couple of years is, is going to be really interesting to see. Yeah, and I, I, I can't completely agree with you, Sarah. Is there going to be such thing as normal? Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, the, would, the, would the normal become abnormal? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. A continuous state of change. And 
um, I think we would we would build the muscles of learning mm-hmm. how to how to lead through that and how to manage that. And um, and I think and I think it's going to be an exciting few years ahead of us. Um, again, we just have to make sure that we understand the perspective of everyone in our society and our customers and and um, the challenges that they're going through um, and then come up with solutions that work for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Rehana, I really appreciate you being with us today and, and sharing your perspective and your insights. And I would love for you to come back in, you know, six months or 12 months and talk about what more you've learned and, and what your next normal has looked like. Yeah, let's do that. All right. Sounds good. All right. You can find more information on how companies are managing COVID-19 and transforming their businesses by visiting us at www.futureoffieldservice.com. You can also find us on LinkedIn and Twitter at The Future of FS. The Future of Field Service podcast is published in partnership with IFS. You can learn more about IFS service management by visiting www.ifs.com. As always, thank you for listening.